underlying graph database. Uh, so let me have a little technical issue before we start. Sorry. Hi. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, I'm Clark Ritchie. I'm still the graph guy. And today uh, we're going to be talking about some very specific use cases uh, in which companies have successfully deployed graph technologies to solve a variety of problems. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking uh, about instances where they deployed Neo4j uh, as that graph database technology. So uh, not a ton of visuals for this one, unfortunately. I'll, I'll try to show you a few things, uh, mostly in text, and I will probably subject you to a little bit of my atrocious drawing to try to uh, illustrate a couple of concepts. So I'm going to apologize for that ahead of time. Uh, so in the meantime, I do also want to remind you uh, of our website, uh, graph-guy.com. Uh, so again, uh, you can see all of the uh, recaps from our previous shows and things uh, here. And again, if you missed it last week, we had a great show where we had uh, Steve Stone, <clears throat> former CIO of both L Brands and Lowe's, uh, uh, on to talk about his experiences in retail and um, you know, his thoughts on graph. Really great episode. We may have Steve back on uh, at some point. So if you haven't seen that, I strongly recommend you you come in uh, over to the website and check out the uh, the video recap or the actually the full video from last week's uh, episode. All right, so let's jump a little. Let's jump right into uh, some specific uh, use cases. So um, one of the ones I want to talk about right out of the gate. And again, I'm just try to, uh, so you don't just have to uh, believe uh, me, but uh, uh, give some sources. This is from the Neo4j's uh, blog, talking about pricing and revenue management here. And uh, this particular case study uh, revolves around one of my personal favorite companies, uh, Marriott International, right? So Marriott, obviously, one of the world's largest uh, hotel hospitality providers. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, one of the challenges for any really large hospitality provider uh, is pricing. Uh, you have tens of thousands of rooms across the world. Uh, how do you price all of those? And ideally, um, you want to be able to price those uh, by demand. Uh, and well, supply and demand, right? So for example, you might have a base rate for all of your rooms in a certain location. Uh, but if a major event is scheduled, uh, prices typically would go up. Uh, if you're nearing a particular uh, date and there's a lot of availability, so all high supply, you will often want to try to drop prices uh, dynamically uh, so that you um, can try to fill up those rooms and not let them go uh, to waste. Excuse me. Um, so that's the challenge. Of course, the challenge is how, how do you do that at scale? How do you do that rapidly? And this is a problem the airline industry has faced, hospitality industry has faced, uh, and Marriott uh, solved that. But before about how they solved it, what I think is really, really interesting too is, is this, uh, these two paragraphs here, where they say again that they use this highly normalized data model, right, consisting of about 10 levels in a, in a relational database using, you know, foreign keys. Um, so that's, you know, a pretty complicated uh, database and Marriott has some very fine engineers. So uh, you know, we can assume that this was probably a pretty well optimized relational database management system. Uh, and so they created these rate programs to try to dynamically adjust these rates. Uh, but look at this. Some of these programs required 30,000 lines of SQL. 30,000 lines. Now, I was just not one query, right? I'm sure it wasn't one query that's 30,000 lines long. Uh, it's probably uh, you know, many queries, but uh, it probably isn't necessarily that many. And I love the fact that, like, well, that took too long. Well, yes, I can imagine executing 30,000 lines of SQL uh, would take too long. So Marriott had a lot of hardware uh, behind this. 
uh, but their business requirement, right? And that's what really matters. What is their business requirement? Was to be able to publish these changes in less than 60 seconds. Um, and it turns out it was uh, it was over four minutes, over 240 seconds to to run some of these queries. And uh, if we follow this this link, uh, what we see is really interesting to me. So uh, this is not Marriott's code. Um, but it's, it's uh, illustrative of the concept, right? So if you've been following along with the show for a while, you know that I've talked on several different occasions uh, ab about the fact that one of the things I really enjoy about Cypher is it is expressive and it's readable. And because of that, you can create queries that are very powerful in a very, very small uh, amount of uh, uh, of cipher code, right? I can, I can do a lot with a little bit. Um, so here in this particular blog post, they're illustrating that concept. And uh, similar to what Marriott is doing, uh, they have a recommendation engine saying like, hey, you know, so uh, can, we, can we, can we in a very simple case or simple situation scenario, uh, make a recommendation to a customer what they should buy. I mean, look at this cipher query here, and, and, and this is what I love about it. It's really, you can just read it, and I can see, okay, I'm going to find, I'm going to match I'm gonna f uh, a customer with a particular customer ID who bought a product, uh, and then this product was also bought by a different customer, a peer customer, we're calling them, who bought uh, some other product. Okay, so, you know, a customer who bought something that I bought, uh, bought something that I bought, but also bought something different. Uh, where, oh, where I did not, so if that you is me, or is the first customer, bought that product, but this relationship does not exist. Like that's really readable to me at least. Uh, sure, I've been doing Cypher for a little while, but I, I feel like this is pretty readable. And then what are we gonna return? We're gonna return this uh, recommended product, so our ECO, that's the variable for this product, this recommended product, um, and we're going to return how many times this occurred and call that the frequency. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, order the results uh, by frequency and descending order, giving us the top five. So the top five most purchased products that someone uh, else purchased uh, when they purchased the thing that I'm buying, but yet I haven't purchased that. Really nice, right? And this is nicely formatted. Uh, and it's one, two, three, four, five lines of really nicely formatted uh, query. That's simple to understand, at least in my opinion. Uh, so what I love, and again, I think this really helps illustrate what happened with Marriott. If we're getting thinking about correct pricing, they had some queries that were 30,000 or you know, some um, tasks that took 30,000 lines of SQL to process. And again, not necessarily all one query, but that's still a massive amount of SQL, right? Well. Here is an equivalent uh, SQL query to what we just read. Is this. So just count it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 lines of well formatted SQL versus 5. You know, that's a 3x expansion. Uh, and if we try to look at this and read it, and I, uh, back in the day, used to write a lot of, uh, of SQL. But this is rough, right? And this is not a particularly complicated SQL query as far as SQL queries go, right? Those of you who might be watching and are, and are um, you know, true experts in SQL, like that, is very simple. But if we try to read this, right? Select uh, product name from the product table as recommendation uh, and the count of that as the frequency. Again, from the product table, the customer product mapping, we've got a sub-select here, right? Where we're getting product IDs from a different uh, table uh, where we're matching on the customer ID on, on here, we're joining on product. It, it's, it's a lot already, right? There's a lot of joins, there's this inner query, we're falling back into the outer query, then we've got a group in order. It, I'm kind of just over it, honestly, ready. Um, so of course this can lead to you know performance issues because the join complexity, uh, performance can degrade in really large data sets and, and so on. So again, not Marriott's query, This is, but this I think is a really excellent illustration of uh, Cypher, 
versus SQL. So again, if we jump back to Marriott in particular, we can see uh, that they, you know, in, in their initial prototype, um, uh, at least, uh, their longest query here was over four minutes for one of the more complex ones. Um, and in the prototype alone, they got them 34 seconds on the graph database. Again, you know, why? Simplicity, right? If you're trying to run, uh, trying to join things across many, many hops of data, that's what graph is good at. Uh, and this is, you know, a wonderful case uh, here where they did that. So they got a tenfold increase in publishing volumes, 96, uh, and we're talking about publishing, they're talking about publishing price changes. Uh, a 96% reduction in publishing times, and they cut their server and infrastructure capacity down by 50%. So again, uh, from four minutes to half minutes, so an 8x increase in speed uh, on less than half the server capacity and infrastructure. That's huge, right? And this is, you know, you, there, are, there is no larger hospitality chain in the world than Marriott. Uh, and this has continued to be successful for Marriott. This was written a while ago. Uh, this has continued, this was, I think, written back in 2018. Uh, this has continued to roll out for uh, Marriott. Those of you who may follow Marriott closely know that about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, they actually implemented even uh, more granular and, and, and faster price changes. Uh, and that's based upon this system that they've been working on for a while, based on Neo4j. So I, I love this as a use case. Uh, the second use case I want to talk about, and I bring this one specifically because um, I hear people all the time tell me, well, you know, property graphs, okay, but really what I need is RDF because I need natural language processing. Um, or, 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 and I, if I dive into that with people, I very rarely get anything more detailed than that level. I need natural language processing, so I have to do RDF. And I said, well, why? Why? What is it about RDF that you believe is intrinsically better uh, about natural for natural language processing than a labeled property graph? And, and I don't ever seem to get an answer, but you see it happening all of the time. Uh, it's many, many cases. So this particular use case, uh, make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, is uh, is Caterpillar. So Caterpillar, of course, is you know makes you know heavy equipment, right? We're all familiar with the giant bulldozers and so forth. We've seen, um, and uh, if you talk to Caterpillar, you've discovered that really they're interested in documents, believe it or, or not. Um, so they have more than twenty-seven million documents that they use to track vehicle repairs and maintenance. And uh, if you were to read through this you see that basically whenever a vehicle comes in for repair, a document gets created that, uh, that details, you know, what is the repair? How is it tied to the warranty? What's the problem? What's the technician say needs to be done and so forth. Um, and the company needs to be able to process that. Uh, so someone can basically ask, you know, questions uh, about that uh, to, to figure out, you know, how, how to, to do that. Uh, they tried to do it with a relational doc with a relational database and, and didn't really get anywhere. So they wanted some natural language processing, and what they did uh, is they used a uh, an NLP toolkit written in Python in this particular case uh, to break down the text of the document, the text of the queries, essentially into uh, across linguistic tokens or boundaries uh, to to make it interest to make it. Um, uh, something that could be uh, parsed and, and dealt with in the graph. Uh, they used uh, WordNet as a dictionary to provide explanation of the words. They used the Stanford dependency parser to parse the text and so forth. So they used some external tools, which you would no matter what, right? You need some industry uh, standard quality tools to parse out the data, to parse out the natural language portions of it, to, to create dictionaries, parse things out. Um, then it becomes, well, how do you now find this connection, right? So if you know, if you've broken down your sentence into those uh, sort of lexical structures and, and building blocks, uh, and you know they're connected, uh, how, how can you follow those connections to get answers, right? That is a, a, certainly a question of, of many, many links, right? Uh, through, through a, a sentence, through a paragraph, certainly through a document to understand intent. 
Um, and so they used graph for that. They conducted meaningful searches with simple cipher queries. Um, and here you see their senior data scientist, Ryan Chandler, talking about that. Um, how you know it, it is a it is a perfect fit with a graph database. Uh, and so uh, you know Caterpillar had a tremendous amount of success with this. We don't know all the details exactly, um, but I, I again I point this out uh, specifically to any of you who are out there and are thinking about RDF or think about natural language processing. Uh, and, and yes, there are toolkits and so forth that do exist on RDF uh, to, uh, to, to do some work with natural language processing, uh, but they're no way exclusive to RDF. There's nothing intrinsic uh, about uh, RDF that makes it better for natural language processing. And again, as with uh, I have with every other topic so far, I would argue that at scale, it becomes harder to do. And certainly if anyone is super knowledgeable about RDF and wants to come on the show and, and talk about that, I'd, I'd love to, to discuss this in a, in a rational way uh, on, on the show one, one day. So please feel free to uh, reach out uh, to me and I, I would love uh, to do that. Uh, next, let's talk uh, a little bit about, uh, we're going to force you into, into my drawings, uh, into about, here we go, uh, a particular use case that I was directly involved in. Um, this was a Fortune 200, now let's see how I can do, I haven't drawn it, so we'll just make this for short and say Fortune 200 retail company. So uh, I'm really not supposed to, to say the name of them. So let's say the Fortune 100 retailer, um, you've definitely seen them. You've probably bought things at them or, you're, or, you're, or your significant other has for sure. Uh, and uh, they had a number of challenges. What they wanted to achieve was essentially uh, a 360 degree uh, view of the customer. Um, and this is something that people talk about a lot these days. It was a little bit newer back when we did it for them a couple of years ago. Uh, but what they mean by this 360 degree view of the customer is really understanding uh, not only what is the customer buying, but attempting to understand what, what is impacting their buying, meaning uh, are sales impacting their buying, promotion impacting their buying, uh, the location of the store, um, the layout of, of products and goods uh, uh, on, the, on the showroom floor. What is it that is really happening with the customer so that they can, of course, uh, you know, put out the best uh, products, the best promotions uh, to meet the needs of the customer. And this includes things like um, product trials uh, and so forth. So uh, what are the things um, challenge that they had is being a Fortune 200 retailer, they had a lot of data. Uh, they had over 25 million customers. That's a, that's a fair chunk of customers. Um, and uh, if you think about the many customers and they had over, over approximately 1,500 stores, uh, and so this is a lot of transactions. They had over 500 million products. Just uh, in, and uh, again, this is in you know this, these are distinct SKUs, right? So, uh, so uh, a lot of data. So how much data does this really uh, amount to? Uh, this amounted to uh, over three billion nodes in the database. That was approximately 14 billion relationships. And uh, it was over 20 billion properties. And the first thing that I want to point out, because I, I still hear this all the time, is oh, property graph doesn't scale, graph doesn't scale. That's a lot of nodes. Three billion is a lot of nodes. And again, dirty little secret, 
uh, well, not really, nothing really dirty about it, but this uh, was actually implemented, uh, of course, on Neo4j. This was a while back. This was 2.x. 4x is significantly more performant. This worked on Neo 2x, and, well, you say, well, that must be a lot of hardware. No, this was commodity hardware. It was three servers. Why was it three servers uh, for uh, failover? Could have been done on a single server if high availability didn't matter, uh, but three commodity servers. Uh, and these were only uh, 32 cores each. These were not massive. 32 cores, and I want to say 256 gig of RAM. These were not massive machines. Uh, even several years ago when we did this, these were not massive machines. Uh, you can certainly get much larger machines um, now. So what kind of things uh, do they successfully do with this 360 view customer uh, that they couldn't do or couldn't do well otherwise? Well, one classic example uh, is basket analysis. What is basket analysis, Clark? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. Uh, let me see if I can scroll this page down a little bit. Lovely. So basket analysis. Uh, classic retail uh, issue. They were certainly doing it. You have to do it to do retail well. But basket analysis is essentially looking at if if I go into the store uh, and you know I purchase I purchase a pen. Uh, what else did I purchase with this pen? Did I buy paper with the pen? <clears throat> did I buy some other good? And retailers, of course, care about this because this 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 impacts uh, product placement in stores. This impacts uh, how do I discount things in stores, how do I market things, and so forth. So really understanding, uh, you know, this is crucial. And if you know, if you want to go down a rabbit hole on the internet, look up the, uh, you know, the whole beer and diapers story of basket analysis. Uh, gets into some really uh, <clears throat> sort of interesting uh, history on, on this and, and consumer behavior and, and, and so forth. Um, and so the challenge, though, with basket analysis is if you think about the product, I think about the domain, right? So you have a customer, and a customer makes a transaction. So that is a TX, okay? Uh, and that transaction occurs at a store. And uh, that transaction has line items. That LI. And those line items uh, are for certain products. Right? And those products, of course, have, have different attributes, right, uh, of them. I mean, all of these things certainly do. Um, typically, transaction will have more than one line item, right? So you know, I'm going to draw the dotted line here because the, you know, the model stays the same. Uh, but it's kind of important to understand that typically there is more than one line item. Uh, which could go again to a different uh, product. Right, so my drawing skills have really moved up here. Draw dotted lines now. Um, so uh, if you want to understand, and, oh, and that transaction typically was then tied to um, uh, essentially what we'd call like a retail day. Uh, and, and the reason that was done um, really has to do for some optimization for analyses and, and, and so on. Um, but, uh, so if you want to figure out, and, and customers are often tied to a demographic segment, so a demographic segment, and this would be, you know, like, um, uh, you know, women of a certain age group, men of a certain age group, single men of a certain age group, thing, things like that, right? So you know, retailers will um, define different demographic segments very often to try to help understand uh, large groups of, of customers and their behavior and so on. So now if I want to understand, um, oh, in a store, right, is often in a... Um, stores will typically be broken down into uh, essentially regions. So again, if I'm a big, um, I don't know why I decided to write that out, but I did. Um, if you've got 1,500 stores, uh, you break those down into regions, right? 
Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, Western, Southern, and so forth. Again, so you can set uh, business goals and, and do segmentation and so forth. So now if I want to understand uh, basket analysis for say a region for a particular period of time, even a, say a week, I've got to find all customers who made transactions uh, with that retail day was in a certain time period um, and whose stores are in a particular region and then for every transaction, I need all of the line items and all of the products uh, that are associated with those line items. And then I'm gonna do the, there's some complex math to do for basket analysis, right? Um, but this is the query essentially, right? So that's a whole lot of hops. Oh, and if I want to do it just for a particular you know, customer segment, now I've got to add another hop. But even without that, I'm talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, Six hops minimum, assuming that we just make one, uh, have one line item, and then add uh, at least two more uh, relationships uh, every time that transaction contains more than one thing. Uh, and I've got a lot of customers. So this is something that is very, very difficult to do at speed in a relational database. Um, obviously, they were doing it. It took a lot of work. Uh, it, it would typically take to, to do this uh, for a particular store, for, for a, not a region, a store for a week. It would take um, over one day of work on a relational database uh, type system uh, to do this pre-graph. Um, moving this to a Neo4j based graph uh, brought that query down uh, to less than one second, less than a second. So uh, with this substantial increase in performance, not only now do we save a whole lot of time and labor, uh, not only do we get significant, the ability to make significantly faster business decisions, um, they got the ability to do more things. So as I mentioned, these products uh, had a lot of different properties uh, associated with them. Uh, size, for example. So. Um, one of the things, uh, this one of the things you, we, we saw was that um, one of the main, if you, if you just look at, um, if you just looked at this as the at the SKU level, right? So again, so let's say I'm selling, say I'm selling shirts, uh, and uh, all shirts of a particular style and color, the same, a particular style have the same uh, SKU. Uh, even if they're uh, of these uh, different color, different size, and they get, you just have to basically look at the, you know, the attributes to say like, oh, I bought two shirts, but one was red and one was blue, or they're the same style. Um, so if you don't, if you don't differentiate these by those, those, my, if I purchase two shirts and one is, one is red and one is blue, um, it really just looks like I just bought, um, you know, that same product twice. Uh, and that's that's fine. So you can do best that. Say, go. I brought a shirt and I brought pants with it. Might be the top uh, pairing, a uh, particular style shirt with a particular style of pants. So uh, to just capture that. So again, pre-graph, you might say, oh, pants of a particular style and shirt were the top pairing, right? People, uh, the most common pairing might have been again. If I bought pants, I bought this shirt with it. Um, well. It's more complex than that, though, and we said, "Well, let's let's let you look at because this is so fast now, because I can do this so quickly. Let's let's add more complexity to this. Let's take this query, and instead of just finding customers who bought, you know, the made a transaction, purchased an item, who found a particular product, let's say who bought a particular product uh, of a certain size. Let's add that so that if I buy uh, two shirts of a different size, uh, you know, we'll we'll show." Uh, that level of granularity, so that you're adding another dimension to this query. And so when you do that, this no longer becomes a top pairing. What we saw was essentially, um, and I'm, I'm kind of changing the data a little bit here to to uh, safeguard, to, to obfuscate the company we did. But so I bought a pant, let's say in size medium, and the same pant in size large that became the most frequent pairing, no longer just a pant with a shirt. <clears throat> so what does that really tell us? If 
if we look closer at the data, uh, it's not that I'm buying shirts and pants together. You could probably say, well, sure, that makes sense. A shirt, and a, you know, a, a top and a bottom together. I could, I could tell you that. That's not what's really happening. That's a surface level observation. What's really happening when we have the power to look more closely at the data is that I'm buying the same pant twice in the same transaction, but in different sizes. What does that mean? That must mean that there is uh, some level of ambiguity to the customer as to what is really my size. Am I a medium or am I a large? So I'm probably going to buy both of these, go home, try them on, and I'm gonna return one. And if I'm going to return one, that means that this sale at this margin is not really accurate. Um, it, it's gonna be returned. Half of, half of this sale potentially could come back as a return. And if you went and historically looked at the data, you saw that yes, that was exactly what was happening. Um, so not only by using graph did, you just, do they, did they see a significant increase, uh, sorry, a significant decrease in the query time and therefore the amount of resources required. Uh, and they saw a, a, a commensurate ability to react more quickly in the business and they could get better data. It's not always just being to do it faster, but being to get more detail to that data. Um, another thing that they were able to do, yeah, if I can scroll the screen, that would be amazing. All right, we'll try it up here. Um, is uh, to do, again, uh, product testing so if you're again if you're a retailer and you're you're thinking about bringing a new product to market you typically you know you, you take your new product uh and you want to test it um at you know uh you know 10 stores for example uh and and you want to then capture demographics uh who's buying who are customers who are making a transaction where the line name contains your new product and you want to go back and you want to look at what, what demographic segment are they in. Uh, you want to, again, do basket analysis, to see what else are they buying. Uh, you want to do math and see, uh, you know, of the purchases uh, of, of those new products, uh, how many, you know, what is the percentage of that purchase, either by volume or by uh, revenue uh, of all the purchases at that store. Uh, you want to look at, you know, so if I'm bringing up this new test product, and I believe I'm targeting a certain demographic. Is that the demographic that is really buying my product? Is it another demographic and so on? So we get a lot of queries um, tying a number of things together, even across 10 stores, uh, because you can't just do it across 10 stores, which you have to, because that is where you're gonna you know, deploy your, and I'm using 10 as a, you know, an arbitrary number here, it's probably higher than that. Um, that you need to have a control group of stores that doesn't have your new product and compare that data, right? How is a similar set of stores probably in the same region doing for the same period of time and do that math? So again, a lot of data. Uh, and they would do this before, but very soon we saw here, uh, the dimensionality of that data. Uh, the detail they could pull was very low. Why? You don't have a lot of time to mess around with figuring out, am I gonna put this new product in the market or not? Products tend to be seasonal. You have to come up with a product You've got to see, does it work? If it does, you've got to get it into mass production and get it out into the market before the season is passed and that window of opportunity is closed. So this has to be a very, very rapid process. So you need an agile system where you can have that new data be brought in, you can run complex queries on it and get those uh, data essentially in real time. I want to run these queries uh, every single day at the close of business so I know what's happening. And this is something that was very, very difficult to do before. They could do it at only the highest level of granularity. Very large counts, very simple charts. Uh, now, again, using graph, they would really deeply dive into uh, differences in customer segmentation, uh, differences in basket analysis for what was being bought, and gain significantly uh, more, uh, more detailed insight into is this new product uh, actually selling the way they hoped it was going to? Uh, and if not, why not? What was actually happening with it? So lastly, in this, in this particular customer, uh, they did do a lot of dashboarding as well. Again, uh, dashboarding, generally speaking, works really well. And we've talked about this a little bit before in the show, 
the one thing I will caution you of um, is what we talked about before is whole graph queries, right? What do I mean by that? So when I talk about basket analysis, you notice what I said here was I said, I want to look at, you know, customers, I look at transactions with a certain well-defined time period, like a week, uh, and potentially for a certain set of stores that I broke into a region. So if I have 1500 stores, maybe broken into 10 regions, um, you know, that's a 10th of the data right there, but I'm doing this region by region. And if looking at a particular period of time, let's say a week, uh, and if I've got, if I'm carrying, saying a rolling uh, two years worth of data, um, well, that's one out of 104. So that's like 1% of the data there. So I'm only looking at a relatively small segment of that, of those 3 billion uh, nodes uh, that I have in the database. So that works really well, right? I, I can walk that pretty efficiently. But what if I want to understand questions like, um, I want to look at um, the entire brand, the entire chain, right? Uh, for an entire year, and I want to compare it to the previous year. Well, now essentially I'm looking at the whole graph. I want to look at all the customers, all the transactions for an entire year, that's essentially a little more than probably half the data, compared to the transactions for the previous year, well now it's all the data, and really some, some duplication because I'm hitting the same customers and the same products more than one time. Um, that's a massive amount of data. That's a whole graph analytic. Uh, can you do it? Yes, you can absolutely do it in a graph database like Neo4j successfully. You just have to be very deliberate, right? So remember when we talked about basket analysis, what well, we said was very successful, was this ability to on the fly add extra dimensions of granularity to the query uh, and still get very, very rapid results. Because again, we're dealing with a much with, with a relatively small amount of data compared to the total overall size of the graph. If we want to look at the entire graph uh, and still have that same level of performance on the same amount of hardware, we've got to give something up. So uh, one of the things you can give up, you can you can remove some flexibility. Meaning, I can predefine the dimensionalities, the dimensions I want to look at at these queries. Uh, because I'm probably going to have to pre-stage these queries. These queries will take longer to run. I'm hitting all of the database, all of the data in the database. Uh, that has to take longer. Uh, so you get know, lots of ways to attack this pre-staging uh, pre these queries so that they run, uh, you know, overnight. Uh, potentially the systems. There's some really interesting work being done uh, with with uh, Apache Spark X uh, to to do these types of things at scale. Um, but it takes some uh, really thoughtful planning to start doing whole graph queries. Uh, you can do this successfully. Uh, we did do them successfully uh, for this retailer, but it does take uh, a bit more thought uh, than the others. So, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully this was uh, insightful for some of you. Um, I'm uh, happy again to uh, take any uh, requests or uh, comments online. Uh, my uh, information on my uh, Twitter feed is on the closing page. You can hit us up on, on, on the Graph Guy webpage. Uh, so any feedback as well, certainly always welcome. Uh, I enjoyed uh, talking with you and I hope to see you again soon. Uh, join us again soon. I'm Clark Ritchie and I'm the Graph Guy. <laughs>